These amino acids have been used to stop kidney disease. Patients are avoiding dialysis thanks to them. This is how you can do the same. Catherine here, I've been helping kidney disease patients avoiding dialysis for more than a decade now. I know what works and what doesn't when it comes to the renal diet. And I want to share my knowledge with you, my dear subscribers. You are the reason why I make these videos and I really appreciate your feedback and questions. So in this video, I'm going to answer your questions, such as, can you take amino acids to reverse CKD progression and avoid dialysis? And also, is red wine good for the kidneys? And what type of magnesium should you take with diabetes? And more! Yes, today I'm going to answer your questions about the renal diet, because you see, I've met patients who were able to improve their kidney function and to avoid dialysis for years, sometimes decades, all thanks to a diet that protected their kidneys instead of harming them. So how can we make your diet better? Let's start with a very interesting question. How to take amino acids to avoid dialysis? I've heard that you can take amino acids to avoid dialysis. Does that really work? How do I take them? So I received many questions about amino acids and CKD. One of you guys also pointed out that there is a study that shows that taking certain amino acids can arrest the progression of renal failure. And yes, it is true that amino acids have been used to stop the progression of CKD. This is an old study we are talking about that was published in 2004. In this study, 12 patients on a VLPD had an improvement in kidney function. They were also able to stop the progression of kidney disease and avoid dialysis for one year, the whole duration of the study. Okay, now you may ask, if these amino acids work, why isn't everyone taking them? I mean, if this data was real, all nephrologists should be screaming at their patients all day long until they start to take these amino acids. Why aren't they doing that? Well, the truth is that everyone with non-diabetic CKD today is supposed to supplement amino acids. Yes, there are amino acids that can assist you in slowing down CKD progression and delay dialysis, sometimes by decades, says science. I'm talking about keto analogs, by the way. And they could also save you a lot of money, says who, you may ask. Well, the Italian government. You know, the government pays for medical care here in Italy. And they found out that about a decade ago, one year of dialysis costed the Italian government of 34,072 euro. And on the other hand, one year of a low protein diet plus special amino acids costed just 1,440 euro. So you can imagine that CKD patients in Italy take much longer to end up in dialysis compared, for example, to the US, where the patient is going to pay for dialysis. But the question remains, why isn't everyone being told to follow a very low protein diet with amino acid supplementation? Well, probably because they don't watch my videos. I've been talking about this for a long time and I have personally recommended a low or very low protein diet for years. Guys, today, every single kidney disease patient who is not on dialysis and who is not suffering from diabetes is supposed to follow a very low protein diet and to supplement with special amino acids. All right, everyone. As I was saying, there is a huge amount of research supporting the use of the very low protein diet plus amino acid supplementation as a way to delay dialysis. 
And actually, your doctor is supposed to know about this, all right? In fact, even the KDOQI, the guideline for the renal diet, says that all CKD patients should follow either a low or very low protein diet. So talk to your nephrologist and ask them about the very low protein diet and keto acid supplementation if you want to delay dialysis by several years. And watch my video about the VLPD if you missed it. It's up here and also down in description. And guys, I will make more videos like this one in the future. So ask questions in comment section and I will answer them. And don't forget to like this video while you're at it. Now, I've got another question about the topic of the low protein diet from one of you guys. How much proteins should I have a day? Stage 3b. Okay, this is an easy one. Okay, this is an easy one. In stage 3b, you should have exactly 0.55 to 0.60 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight if non-diabetic and 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight if diabetic. These are the exact values prescribed by the most recent guidelines for CKD. And these values are also for any other stage of CKD, excluding dialysis in stage 1 and 2. Now, this is much less protein than people usually imagine. You see, especially for people without diabetes, eating no more than the right amount of protein per day can be challenging. As we can see here, a very low protein diet is a diet plan along avoiding protein. It's not just about not eating meat, fish and cheese. Every meal must be planned carefully. Now, this is only an example. Each patient is supposed to have his own diet plan, all right? Everything is supposed to be personalized today. You don't want to get too much or too little calories, for example. Same for protein. Now, this can be a serious problem for many patients, says a recent study. What they found out is that even patients being monitored by a dietitian were eating too much protein, and that was damaging their kidneys. Yes, protein intake must be monitored very accurately if we are going to seriously delay dialysis. I've shared some simple tricks to achieve just that in my video up here. Watch it now if you missed it. Okay, another question about the renal diet. Is red wine good for the kidneys? Okay, this is from Basil Jaff and I think it's a very interesting question. You know, normally I would have just told you to, you know, completely avoid it. But recently, something happened that made me question that advice. You see, I recently made a video about a man that completely reversed the decline of his GFR with a simple dietary intervention. He was risking dialysis. Then he started this diet. And today, his creatinine level is normal. By the way, I made a full video about this, it's up here and also down in the description. Now, while it's amazing that he was able to get out of kidney disease, there is one thing that's also interesting. This is the diet he was prescribed. And since he was part of a study, everything was monitored accurately. And as we can see here, he was still drinking a bit sparingly while he was following the diet that got him out of kidney disease. So do people really need to completely stop drinking? Well, it depends. Can you really do it with moderation? As in, one or two glasses of wine per week? If not, I will just, you know, avoid drinking completely. But if you are 100% sure that you can limit yourself, two glasses of wine per week won't ruin your renal diet. Another very interesting question. Should you be concerned with maltodextrin in supplements? And this question comes from Sana. She always asks very interesting questions and she's probably reading the ingredients of her supplements and she found out that there is maltodextrin in some of them. Is that a bad thing? Now, maltodextrin is used very often in supplements. This is a super processed type of carbohydrate we are talking about, all right? 
So if you read maltodextrin, think very high GI, worse than sugar. It can cause a big spike in your blood sugar levels. Maltodextrin is commonly used as a preservative, as thickener and as filler, both in supplements and in processed foods. It's present in a lot of different products because it's very inexpensive to make and I believe it may also cause some form of addiction just like sugar. Also not many people know that maltodextrin is just like sugar, all right? So some big food brands put it in everything they can. Baked goods, salad dressings, soups, gravies, morning cereals, frozen meals. There is a long list of foods that may contain this additive. And these foods can be dangerous for people with diabetes. That's why I always tell you to read the labels of any packaged foods you buy. So good for you if you are getting informed. Now when it comes to supplements, things are a little bit different. The answer to the question, is maltodextrin in supplements dangerous? Totally depends on the quantity we are talking about. For example, is the maltodextrin in a probiotic pill bad? Probably not. It's a very small amount, but I also believe that you should know about it. But what about a bottle of an energy drink, for example? Well, that's something I would absolutely tell you to avoid. That could cause a spike in blood sugar so big it could be bad even for people without diabetes. Be careful and double check the labels. Up next, another very interesting question. I have stage 3 CKD with anemia. Will it be safe for me to do a lot of juicing with carrots and other veggies or will that cause my potassium levels to go dangerously high? Juicing is not going to make a huge difference with your potassium levels. However, if you do it every day, it can raise them a little bit. This can be an issue if your potassium levels are already high. Or a good thing if your potassium levels are, you know, on the low end. So it actually depends on your levels if juicing is good or bad for your potassium. My advice is to always keep these levels under control, get checked regularly. That's very important in order to dial in your diet. Now, what about juicing in general? Juicing can be healthy. It's a good way to get more vitamins, minerals and other healthy plant nutrients in our diet. But I'm not a huge fan of juicing. You see, when you juice fruit and veggies, you discard the peel and the pith. And that's where most of the fiber and polyphenols and antioxidants of the fruit and veggies are and almost everyone needs to get more fiber in the diet. So my advice here will be to, you know, make a smoothie instead of a juice and make sure you are also including the peel of fruits and veggies. Okay, another interesting question. This was in a video about apple cider vinegar and its incredible benefits for diabetes and weight loss. This is what the comment says. Doesn't work for everyone, been taking apple cider vinegar for 6 months, no results and fasting, didn't lose weight, maybe 2 pounds and blood sugar stayed the same. So this was not really a question but it's still interesting for us. What if a supplement or dietary change doesn't work? Now first of all, losing 2 pounds just due to apple cider vinegar or ACV in short wouldn't be that bad a result, even if it's in 6 months. I mean. They haven't gained any weight and that's already good. This assuming they are taking real, unfiltered and pasteurized ACV, alright? But I understand that this person was expecting more than that from ACV. Why didn't they have the results expected then? Now there are many factors at play here. First of all, not everyone responds the same way to supplements. Some people get huge results, others don't. That's normal. We have the same problems with medications too. Antihypertensive medications are an example. Even with the same baseline blood pressure, some patients will need one medication to get their pressure in check. Some others will need three. So my advice is to try different things and find out what works for you, especially when it comes to foods or supplements that have no important side effects like ACV, even if it doesn't work as much as you hoped. You haven't lost that much. Okay, a question about magnesium now. There are several forms of magnesium. Which do you suggest for diabetic control? Okay guys, you probably already know that supplementing magnesium is very important for kidney health. It can make a huge positive difference. 
especially with diabetes. Magnesium can be used to actually help improve insulin sensitivity. But there is a lot of contradictory information on the internet and there are many types of magnesium supplements. There is magnesium citrate, carbonate dioxide, glycinate, malate and more. Which one are you supposed to take? Now the most used form of magnesium in medical literature is magnesium oxide. Some influencers will however tell you not to take certain forms of magnesium like magnesium oxide because they are not well absorbed by the body. So who is right? YouTube influencers or medical science? Well, I believe I'll stick with medical science on this one, alright? So my recommendation for magnesium is also for diabetes, magnesium oxide. It's extremely cheap, extremely easy to find and well it works. There are many, many studies proving the effectiveness of this form of magnesium also in people with diabetes. Now magnesium citrate is also well supported by science and it is better absorbed than oxide. So you could also try that one. So my advice here is to try one of these very cheap and easy to find forms first. And only think about trying a more specialized form if none of this works for you. Okay guys, a question now that I get a million times a day. Isn't the potassium from these healthy foods you talk about dangerous for us? So yeah, a lot of you are still worried about potassium and it's normal. Doctors have been telling patients to avoid potassium with CED for decades, but are they right? Well, a lot changed in the way potassium levels are managed in CKD. We know today that the diet is not the problem and patients aren't supposed to avoid high potassium foods anymore. Want to know more about this? My video up here is for you and this is all for today. Thank you for watching. God bless you all. Bye.